Materials used in this presentation are period in nature. When videos are used, they are utilized in conjunction with the photographs to produce continuity. In some instances are composites and fall within the purview of the fair use doctrine of United States copyright laws. Attribution is given where required. Welcome to the True Crime Man Stark Imagination YouTube channel, your one destination for the most factual, engrossing, and intelligent profiles of historical crime on the internet. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell so that you will not miss any further notifications of upcoming episodes. And tell your friends about us. The state of Texas has a rich history steeped in lore and legend. But when it comes to murder, the Lone Star State always does it big, and this profile is no exception. An American serial killer, sometimes known as the Butcher of Elmendorf, the Bluebeard of South Texas, and the Alligator Man, was said to have murdered more than 20 women in Texas and utilized a very unique method of body disposal. On True Crime Man's Dark Imagination, we'll try to decipher between the legend and fact. In 1938, two Bear County Sheriff's deputies visited a businessman in a tavern that he owned to question him about a series of deaths that occurred in Elmendorf, Texas, just outside of San Antonio. When the deputies began the questioning, the business owner took out a handgun and shot himself through the heart. Had this individual been responsible for the murders that took place over the last few years, he most certainly, in Texas, would have faced the electric chair. The businessman that the two deputies went to question was Joseph D. Joe Ball. Ball was born the second child of Frank and Elizabeth Ball on January 6, 1896. Ball's father, Frank Ball, made his way to Elmendorf, Texas in the hopes of striking it rich as he borrowed money from a local bank to open a cotton processing factory. Soon, the railroads ran through Elmendorf and the Ball's business boomed. The elder Ball began dabbling with real estate, buying and selling properties in the area and subsequently opened a general merchandise store. Joe was one of eight children and his other brothers and sisters went on to become pillars in the community. When Joe Ball was very young, he developed a keen interest in firearms and developed his shooting skills over the course of the next few years with practicing almost every day. Ball's nephew, Bucky Ball, stated of his uncle one time, my uncle could shoot a bird off a telephone line with a pistol from the bumper of a Model A Ford. When the United States entered World War I, Ball went to fight for his country on the front lines of Europe. Ball saw intensive combat and almost assuredly this affected his behavior once he returned home to Texas after receiving an honorable discharge in 1919. After returning from the war, Ball worked for his father for a short while and then quit. Seeing that there was really no other way to make a living, Ball turned to the illegal practice of bootlegging, providing the cheapest of liquor for those who could pay, mostly whiskey and beer. After a few years, the bootlegging business grew and Ball hired an assistant, a young black man named Clifton Wheeler. Wheeler subsequently did all the dirty work and the heavy labor. Later, Wheeler stated that when Ball was inebriated, he would shoot a pistol at Wheeler's feet to get him to dance the jitterbug. When Prohibition ended, Ball bought some land and opened a sleazy roadside saloon known as the Sociable Inn, located on Highway 181, just outside of Elmendorf. In the back of the saloon, Ball had two bedrooms. Visitors and ne'er-do-wells from all over Texas ventured to this little hole in the wall in Elmendorf, and Ball had other rooms where men could drink and have cockfights. Behind the saloon, Ball built a pond and thereafter brought in five alligators. Although most knew Ball around town, they referred to him as a creepy guy. The sociable inn became semi-famous, and then later infamous, for the pretty waitresses and the alligator pit in the rear yard of the establishment. 
Ball built a 10-foot fence around the pit to make sure any curiosity seekers would not stumble into the pit area. In order to maintain the alligators, Ball fed them a steady diet of horse meat and live dogs. Little did the patrons know that Ball fed the reptiles something extra on occasion. Ball knew that he needed a gimmick to draw more people to the saloon. On the busiest night of the week for the saloon, Saturday, Ball would take a small animal and feed it to the alligators. A bit on the morbid side, but it drew the crowds in. A former sheriff's deputy who actually investigated Ball in the 1930s stated, A drunken orgy occurred, and any wild animal, possum, cat, dog, or any other animal without an owner, helped make the show a little better. Get drunk and throw an animal in and watch the alligators. Ball's establishment also became popular due to the types of waitresses he would hire, young, vivacious, and very attractive. But customers began to notice that these young girls started disappearing without a forwarding address. In 1934, Ball met a woman by the name of Minnie Gotthard, or Big Minnie. People thought Minnie to be an officious and loathsome person, but she and Ball began to run the bar together. After approximately three years, Ball lost interest in Minnie and another woman caught his eye. One of Ball's younger waitresses, Dolores Buddy Goodwin. Dolores fell in love with Ball, even though he threw a large bottle at her one time, causing a large scar that started at her eye and ended at her neck. Late in 1937, a complicated love triangle erupted when another waitress, 22-year-old Hazel Shotzi Brown, started working at the bar. Ball fell in love with the young waitress. All three of the women worked at the bar and created a serious situation with the four lovers. In the summer of that year, Minnie disappeared unexpectedly. Relatives of the woman came to the bar after her disappearance, asking questions about Minnie, but Ball sent the message to the relatives that she left town after giving birth to a black baby. A few months later, Ball married Dolores and stated to her that he had took her to a local beach and shot her through the head, burying her there. Dolores seemed to think that this was just a bravado story that Ball related under the influence of alcohol. Dolores never brought the subject up to Ball again. In January 1938, Dolores was involved in a very near-fatal car accident that resulted in the amputation of her left arm. Rumors circulated that one of Ball's alligators took her arm off. Dolores mysteriously disappeared in April of 1938. Not long after, so did Hazel. Even though it appeared that Ball had little luck with his romantic arrangements, his alligators were always with him and he was very protective of them. In one instance, Ball received a complaint of a foul smell coming from the pit from one of his neighbors. When he confronted the neighbor with the complaint, Ball drew a pistol and strongly suggested that he never complain any further. Ball explained that it must have been the smell of the gator's food decaying. The neighbor thereafter moved from the area. Even though several of his love interests kept disappearing, Ball's business boomed and appeared to run without any significant difficulties. In mid-1938, however, Minnie's family began asking questions about their relative once more, stating that they could not locate her anywhere and asked that the Bear County Sheriff's Office step in and investigate. The Sheriff's Office questioned Ball several times, but found no evidence of foul play and discounted him as a suspect to her disappearance. A few months later, the family of another waitress, 23-year-old Julia Turner, came to the area and began asking questions regarding their relative. Turner worked part-time for Ball, so the sheriff's deputies visited the bar owner to ask more questions. Ball stated that Turner informed him that she experienced some personal problems and left without a forwarding address. Police again left and thought no further about the incident. Over the next few months in 1938, several more of Ball's employees disappeared, so police brought him in for more intensive interrogation, but Ball never broke under the pressure and maintained his innocence. Authorities released Ball after the interrogation with no evidence. The girls simply were added to the growing list of disappearances. In September of 1938, a witness came forward and stated that they witnessed Ball extracting meat from a human limb and feeding it to the alligators. Furthermore, another citizen of the town came forward and stated that a foul smell emanated from a barrel behind Ball's sister's residence. The witness stated that the aroma smelled, quote, like something dead inside. End quote. On the morning after the witness reported to the police, deputies John Gray and John Clevenhagen paid the sisters' farm a visit and noticed that the barrel was missing. 
The sister stated she smelled the same thing as the witness. It smelled like death. Deputies Gray and Clevenhagen paid Ball another visit. When Ball learned that the officers planned to take him to San Antonio for another questioning session, Ball stated that he would like to shut the bar down first, so the deputies agreed and took a seat at one of the tables. Ball chugged a beer and then hit the cash register's no-sale button. When the drawer opened, Ball reached inside and brandished a 45 caliber revolver. The two deputies yelled, Don't! But Ball fired around into his chest, piercing his heart and killing him instantly. When news of Ball's death reached the media, deputies from all over the nation gathered at the sociable inn to conduct searches. Perhaps there may have been evidence of some cold cases in the area and law enforcement looked for a way to close those cases. Or at least they hoped. Searching around the outside of the tavern near the alligator pit, investigators discovered rotting meat and an axe that appeared, quote, matted with blood and human hair, end quote. Police theorized that Ball murdered his victims and then dismembered them, subsequently feeding the remains to the gators. Any parts left over were either buried or deposited in the barrel behind his sister's residence. It was then that investigators realized that the situation appeared much larger than they first thought. Since the death of Ball, his assistant, Clifton Wheeler, seemed very reticent to say anything about his dead boss. Authorities realized if they were to decipher the whereabouts of any of the missing women, they needed to exert pressure over the handyman. Deputies Gray and Clevenhagen moved to pick up Wheeler and drive him to the sheriff's station in San Antonio to see what information the young black man could give them. After a long and frustrating day of interrogation, Wheeler finally exposed the whole truth to the lawmen. It seems that when Hazel Brown explained to Ball that she had fallen in love with another man and desired a change in location, in addition to the authorities' accusations that Ball had something to do with Minnie's murder, Ball reached a trigger and seemed to snap and murder Hazel Brown. Deputies Gray and Clevenhagen demanded proof of Wheeler's accusations. So, on the following day, Wheeler led them to an isolated spot outside the city limits of San Antonio. After examining the area for a brief period of a few minutes, Wheeler walked to a spot and began moving the loose soil with his hands. Suddenly, blood began oozing up from the spot. A horrible odor permeated from beneath the ground, causing some other deputies at the scene to vomit. Wheeler dug deeper in the shallow grave and revealed two arms, two legs, and then the torso of a woman. The head, Wheeler explained, was destroyed in a campfire to which he directed the investigators. In the ashes of the campfire, the investigators found a jawbone and some teeth. Wheeler stated that on the night of Hazel Brown's murder, Ball demanded that Wheeler gather up some blankets and some more to drink. Ball appeared to the handyman to already have been inebriated. The two men then traveled in Ball's car to Ball's sister's residence to pick up a 55-gallon drum and then to a nearby river. Wheeler continued that Ball threatened him to dig a grave at gunpoint and then Ball opened the barrel. Inside of the barrel was Hazel Brown's body. Wheeler stated he hesitated to assist Ball with the dismemberment, so Ball had the handyman just hold down the body while he sawed off the body parts. The body appeared to have been in the barrel for quite some time and did smell horribly. Wheeler stated that when the smell became too great, the two men took a break, drank more beer, then returned to their grisly work. When Ball finished the dismemberment, he and Wheeler buried the body. Deputies Gray and Clevenhagen also had questions as to the disappearance of Minnie Gotthardt. Wheeler stated that Ball took Minnie to Ingleside, near Corpus Christi. Ball located a secluded area and under the auspices of a romantic evening, and after a lot of drinking, Minnie became distracted with something, and at that point, Ball leveled a revolver to her head and pulled the trigger, striking her in the temple. Wheeler stated that Minnie had become pregnant and Ball did not want this to interfere with his relationship with Dolores Goodwin. Wheeler and Ball then buried Minnie in the sand and drove back to the sociable inn. On October 14, 1938, with hired hands and heavy machinery in tow, investigators finally located Minnie's decomposing corpse. Wheeler claimed no further information as to the other women. When investigators researched the bar, they discovered a scrapbook with photos of over 100 young women. This led one of the investigators, Chief Deputy Sheriff J.W. Davis, to remark, 
This might lead to the discovery of one or a dozen more murders. Investigators still on the case after 1938 discovered that Dolores Goodwin was alive and well, living in San Diego, California. Two weeks after that, they located another woman in Phoenix, Arizona, whose photo appeared in the scrapbook located by Deputy Davis. Police also discovered that none of the rotting flesh around the alligator pit was human at all. In an interview with the San Antonio Light in 1957, Dolores Goodwin described Joe Ball as, quote, a sweet, kind, good man, and he never hurt nobody unless he was driven to it, end quote. Goodwin also exclaimed that because of the nature she previously described, Ball never fed anyone to the alligators. In 1939, Wheeler was convicted for his part in the disposing of the bodies and spent two years in prison. After his release, he opened a bar, but from then on, he was unable to walk in public or not be hounded by the press. Wheeler left Elmendorf after that, never to be seen again. The state of Texas seized the alligators and placed them in a zoo where they lived out the rest of their lives. If Wheeler were to be believed, Joe Ball murdered two innocent women and then buried their bodies. The gruesome legend was born, obviously, from a limited set of facts, but as historians and crime researchers, we endeavor to get closer to the truth, and we hope we did that with this profile. Until next time. If you enjoyed our presentation of true crime, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell to receive notifications on any further programs.